Hey, Gordana, thank you so much for showing up and taking out the time for this. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I'm uh, super honored. Uh, you had some amazing guests and uh, I can't wait to be another person in the lineup. <laughs> so, yay. yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm super pumped for this chat. Uh, you know, you have some awesome case studies. You've done some incredible work, not just uh, for those clients of yours, but also now the kind of work that you're doing for your own platform, Workello. Uh, so I have a lot of things to cover and I would Let's just like it. to get straight into it. Let's do it. Sounds good. So, you know, just to initiate uh, this, I think I would love to hear from you. What has been it like for you to, you know, being in that director of content ops role and now mm -hmm. being the co-founder of a platform, how it has changed your routine, the kind of work that you do, how do you feel it being in those two different roles? Yeah, uh, that is an amazing question. Uh, well, I guess there's, a, there's a, a huge, huge difference between those two. First of all, with the director of contents role that I had, I knew what I was doing to start with. Uh, you know, you know what good content looks like, you know what quality content looks like, you know how to, I mean, you learn how to manage writers and you know exactly what to ask of them and what to ask of your editors. And you kind of know how to manage that whole system. And it's very straightforward. The content is either good or it's not good. It either works or it doesn't work. You either get a fat graph or you don't get a fat graph. So it's very kind of straightforward. Not to say that that job is easy. It's obviously not, but... Um, you know, you have something to hold on to uh, and, you know, just to measure your success on. But as a startup co-founder, uh, things are just way, way different. I have no idea what I'm doing. It's my first time being a, a startup founder and it's just different. No one can actually teach you how to do this. Uh, it's just something that you kind of have to figure out for yourself. And there is a lot of content out there kind of helps the founders, you know, understand their roles a little bit better and the kind of dedication that they have to have in order to do this. But it's just so different for every single company. It's never linear and it's definitely the biggest challenge that I, I've taken on so far. Uh, but, you know, we're figuring it out. <laughs> we're trying to do the best we can and, you know, hope for the best. But yeah, it's uh, night and day, basically. The difference is crazy. <laughs> yeah, so I've heard, you know, a lot of people who co-found anything, you know, um, from their perspective, they constantly talk about how they have to wear multiple hats, do a lot of things, you know, own everything, those kind of things. Uh, is it true? Have you experienced the same thing? Yeah, uh, I might as well have like 10 heads for all the hats that I have to wear. And it's not just me, you know, it's it's my co-founders as well. Um, you know, you have to be a, a, a product manager. You have to learn how to write product scopes, which I've never done before. You have to learn how to talk to developers and just speak their language because their language is much different than, than mine as like a content person, obviously. Us writers and editors, we talk a lot. Developers don't do that. So you have to learn kind of how to communicate with them. Uh, you have to be a marketer. You just have to be a generalist marketer. It's not enough to know one thing. You have to know everything. Um, you have to be a customer success person. You know, your users are the most important, I guess, part of your business. And you have to talk to them. You have to help yeah. them. You have to learn what they want and develop your products in the direction that they want. So, um, it's it's definitely many 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 hats <laughs> that we have to wear and i think it's i think that's the case for every startup honestly unless you're like a unicorn or something and at that point you're like okay my job here is done i can just do one thing but when you're starting out there's no one else to do the job and you just got to do it um and yeah again hope for the best <laughs> yeah well but as long as you're enjoying it and it's working out for the company of course it, it just you know is good um, yeah, yeah, it's a it's a wild ride, you know. So you just gotta do what you gotta do, and you know, maybe one day you'll get to delegate that. That's the dream. Of course. So moving on to the content ops side of things, at one point mm -hmm. you've managed an obnoxiously big, you know, content team. You've worked with a lot of writers, editors, those kind of, kind of folks, and you've built this whole content operation system for content distribution, which was the agency that you worked at. Mm -hmm. um, what has been your process like, especially working with so many different people and managing such a big clientele 
publishing so many pages because again content velocity is one thing that you folks talk, talk a lot about uh what has been that process been like for you yeah so when we started so we basically um started the agency nick jordan did and he hired me to be his first editor i was a writer just before that um and so we started working with this client that to this day is a kind of our biggest graph 1.5 million organics a month and it's crazy success and everything but a lot has gone into that success and there are a lot of moving parts in the background so when we started we were just working with freelance writers uh, you know just giving them kind of one article per week and uh, managing a lot of people like that but we soon realized that it's not scalable and that we needed an in-house team if we wanted to um, you know get our clients to, to a big fat graph because they were at zero when they started and you know we were kind of also at zero um and so we started hiring people in-house um and just kind of figure out the process from there so i hired my first three writers in january 2020 and by i think december 2020 we were at 45 people uh it was insane <laughs> And you just don't really have a lot of time to go slow and learn how to manage all these people. You've got to figure it out on the spot. But the one thing that really did help us a lot was even when it was just the two of us, Nick and I were spending a lot of time writing our SOPs. And at the time, that was kind of ridiculous to me because why am I writing the SOPs? I don't even have a team. Uh, but that was absolutely crucial because I had the base and I could expand on it instead of starting all over when I'm already at 20 people that I have to manage and, you know, I'm responsible for their career, you know, their, their monthly paycheck, they got to eat and uh, you just don't really have the luxury to figure stuff out when you already have a big team. So our process has been, I mean, fairly simple, honestly, we were just always looking for the best person we could find whenever we run a hiring cycle. And we invested a lot in their education with, you know, first our writing guidelines and just enablement documentation in general. And then when we started uh, promoting them to bigger roles like editors and, you know, content managers and things like that, uh, again, with the help of our SOPs, we taught them essentially how to do these things. None of my editors were editors before uh, they started working with me. Uh, a lot of my writers weren't even writers when they started working with us. So uh, if you want to build a content team, start with the SOPs. Even if you have no one, just do it. And eventually when you hire someone, uh, you'll have something to go off on. Uh, but as far as hiring goes, get as many candidates in your funnel as you can and pick the top 1%. That's my very simplistic way <laughs> of describing uh, how yeah. to do it. but of course a lot goes into it. No, th this makes sense. You know, when you mentioned that you were managing a team of you know forty five people at one point, uh, and it grew so so fast, my initial question was, how were you dealing with roadblocks and bottlenecks and all of those kind of things? But now, then you mentioned SOPs, and you started building yep. building them when you had no team. Um, would yes. you say that you know handling all of those bottlenecks or roadblocks? Um, like can be attributed to having those SOPs and those systems in place, or is there anything else that comes into it? 100%. Uh, I think 90% of problems are solved just by having a good system. Anything else is, you know, just a matter of having enough people to do what you need them to do. Roadblocks are going to happen, even if you have the best system in the world. At one point, you'll realize I have to produce 50 articles for this client this month, but I only have two writers. What what am I supposed to do now? Well, obviously you need to hire more writers, but if you don't have a system of onboarding those writers, first hiring those writers, then onboarding those writers, if you don't have the editors who can handle that workload, you're not gonna be able to do it. And you know, there's gonna be bottlenecks in every single step of your goal, which is publishing those 50 pages. So SOPs, I, I'd say are 90% of our, Kind of success or, or eliminating bottlenecks or roadblocks uh and the other is just kind of good management i guess uh and having good people on board because i see a lot of agency owners small agency owners that think like oh i'll just hire a couple of writers i'll do all the editing myself 
and all the keyword research myself and all the client management myself and everything else myself. Like, no, you can't do that because one thing is going to fail. Uh, either it's going to be your sales, which is you getting more money, or it's going to be something related to content. Like you're not going to edit the articles properly and you're going to put out bad content and then you're going to lose clients. But because yeah. you're editing so much content, you don't have time to go and get new clients. So it's like a vicious yeah. cycle. And I would say for anyone who's starting out, uh, or even if you're not starting out, even if you already have a team, invest in your people, especially your editors, <laughs> because they are worth their weight in gold. Um, and everything becomes so, so, so much easier after you've solved that. Yeah. Because that's yeah. like then the main thing sense. you have to deliver. Mm -hmm. yeah. Totally. Uh, so you know, you mentioned about SOPs and how you started building them and like there was no team, like you, you were building them in advance, right? Yeah. Um, I remember it, it was the same case with Flying Cat when I joined, it was a very small team and, you know, my uh, was building a lot of SOPs and we also had support from other team members, etc. And it didn't really make sense to me at the start, but then as soon as I learned how to handle, you know, big content operations, that was like, okay, that's how it works. Uh, so there are a lot of companies that I see still not paying a lot of attention to building these systems, you know, building these SOPs, etc., um, And they have this random flow of content publishing, right? And it feels like when I look at them, it feels like the, the bigger tier companies that are publishing a lot of content, uh, they have those systems, but not because they wanted to, but because at that stage they have to, right? Because they have, yeah. like, otherwise it just cannot function. Um, why do you think companies just like are so ignorant to this one piece of content operations and like pay attention to it, you know, like very, very late typically? Honestly, I think uh, because it's boring, <laughs> it's uh, hard work. No one wants to do it. It's not like the most fun thing that you can do. You know, you would rather go if you're more of an entrepreneurial person, agency owner, you want to go out and you want to make money. That's your main goal. You don't want to sit in your room and write SOPs forever. Uh, but if you don't write them, your team is not going to write them because they don't know. They don't have that um, knowledge in their brain. They're like, oh, I actually need to write this for my other team members. So it has to come from the top. Uh, but I think people don't do it because managing people is so hard. Um, most, you know, SEOs don't want to do it. And so they just kind of avoid it until the last moment. But the last moment was six months ago. <laughs> you know? By the time you realize you need them, you already needed them a long time ago. So I think that's the main reason. Yeah. Uh, and then they just kind of scramble and try to make something, but it's usually not that great. Um, and look, I get it. It's not my favorite thing in the world either. I was crying when I was writing those SOPs. Like, why am I doing this? This is so stupid. No one's going to read this. But I'm so glad that we did it uh, because I don't, I have honestly no idea what we would do without them. And if anyone is struggling writing these SOPs, um, you know, I'm sorry to say, but you just have to do it. It's like going to the dentist. You got to do it. You can't avoid it yeah. <laughs> or else you're going to lose yeah. your teeth. Uh, with this, you're going to lose your money and you're, you're going to lose, lose your team. Uh, but if you can't, if you're struggling to start, there are a lot of people out there that sell them like we do. You know, we have this uh, content ops framework that we've created. It's basically all the SOPs that we use in an agency. I know you guys have your own thing, too. Um, you know, yeah. a lot of people do it. Ben Goody has, uh, you know, some of his SOPs. So there are, are places out there where you can go out and get that piece to get you started uh it's just a matter of finding someone with kind of similar ambitions to yours and just finding a, a an sop provider i guess that uh does what you want to do so that's my advice um if you yeah. are struggling but in any case even if you buy someone else's SOPs, you're still gonna have to write your own like yeah everything totally. is project specific yeah. so um if this yeah. can help you get started but you still have to do a lot of work. Yeah, and then, then if you're writing them on your own, perhaps you can tailor it to the approach that works best for your company, right? Yeah, of course. There are some things yeah. I think that are universal, like writing guidelines. I mean, that's just the English language, right? That's the same wherever you are, whatever company you are, same with any other languages, but of course, project specific things and kind of company specific things. It should be you who's uh, you know writing them and at least tailoring them to your own personal situation 
Um, so yeah, guys, just do it, please. Don't skip yeah, it because you will be yeah, sorry. Totally. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I think another thing that has really worked for me, like if I, you know, go back to the time when I just didn't pay a lot of attention to how important SOPs were versus now, uh, is just seeing how big of an impact uh, it like actually has on your overall company. Like if you can maybe attach, you know, some sort of a money value or time being saved or, you know, or mental hassle being, you know, saved then you can just like actually see the value that they have. Like one thing that I started to do every time I create a new process, like being in the issues of head of SEO now, uh, most of my work is, you know, just building new systems, revamping the processes. Yeah. A lot of it is about that, right? So if I like create a new system, maybe a Google sheet and then build an SOP on how to use it, uh, and it cuts down the time it takes to do something from four hours to one hour, then I'm like, okay, so I've saved a lot of money for the company, you know? So yeah. that's a big win. It's just just to convince yourself that this is important and this is a good allocation of your time. 100%. And also, of course, what you just said, you know, you, you know exactly how much your team makes per hour and, you know, you cut their time from four to one, but also your own time. Uh, and even as a, as a business owner, you may not think of yourself as, kind of a salaried employee, but you are, you know, your time is worth yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. Calculate how much you make per hour and then see how many hours you spend explaining the same thing over and over again, answering the same questions over and over again. And it's not your team's fault for asking you. They are supposed to ask you that, but it's your job to make it possible for them to just find the answer somewhere and you're saving money all over, you know, your team's time, your own time, everything. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. So, uh, if I were to ask you, imagine you're, you know, advising a B two B SaaS company, right? And they have ambitious organic growth targets. So they want to scale their traffic really, really fast. And now, since everyone knows, whenever they think of you or anyone from content distribution, they think of those, you know, gigantic case studies like you know, zero to hundred thousand visitors in twelve months, eight months, those kind of things. Um, if you were to advise a company, you know trying to go after ambitious targets of traffic growth um, on how to set up a team, like what kind of roles they should have, what what should the structure look like? What would you say in an ideal scenario? Yeah, so um, that's a really, really good question. Uh, you know, start with the writer. You always start with the writer, I think. Um, get as many candidates as you can find someone who's the best and actually don't hire just them, hire three more people. Uh, if you do that, that is going to give you a more of a surface area to find your first editor. That's what happened with me. Uh, and that's what also happened to me as well. You know, I was a writer. I was one of 10 writers that Nick worked with. I was the best one, got hired to be an editor. When I was hiring my own writers, I did the same thing. I hired five and, you know, I think I kept four. Uh, promoted one of them to be my editor. She's now our head of growth, uh, you know, so a lot of things can happen. Nice, nice. Uh, so, yeah, so start with the writer first and foremost. While, you know, these writers are writing the initial, I don't know, 10, 15 pages of content, build your SOPs, uh, build your knowledge base, build everything that you can build to promote these people and make them more independent in their work. And then just promote one to an editor and then give them some responsibility. You know, your editors, our editors manage writers. You know, they meet with them. They have these like editorial pods, <laughs> whatever they call them now. Uh, you know, they meet once a week, twice a week, depending on the project. Um, and they're just there for, for the writers for any questions that they may, they may have. So that's initially taking a lot of load off your back as someone who's, let's say, a marketing head or, or I don't know, uh, head of a department or just a co-founder in general, it doesn't matter. So you already don't have to worry about that. And as you move forward, you know, you're hiring more writers, you're promoting more writers to editors. At one point, your best editor is going to be your senior editor, and then they're going to manage editors. They're going to manage your content calendar. Uh, they're going to write more SOPs. And it's kind of like a snowball effect, but it always starts with just one person. And I do highly recommend for that person to be a writer uh, right. because all the people that are on your content team, I believe should be an excellent writer, first of all. Uh, second of all, it just gives them the opportunity to first experience exactly what they're supposed to ask from their um, team members later on. So all my editors, 
my head of growth, my executive editor, they all used to be writers and they know exactly right. what kind of quality we're looking for. They know exactly what the writers are going through. So they know how much they can ask of them. And, you know, if, if they need to do something, if, if the writers have to do some additional work. So I don't have to worry about that at all because they're taking care of all of that. So, um, yeah, start with the writer, build your SOPs, and then just let people own stuff um, because everyone wants to own something and be ahead of something or, I don't know, spearhead a project or whatever you want to call yeah. it. Uh, just let them do it and uh, publish a lot of good quality content. That's nice. it. And there's no way you're going to fail. No way. Yeah. So, so it, it sounds like a solid content person is what you need, and then you start to, like... You know, expand the team from there on like really good writers then they you know some of those will become editors some of those will become you know content directors yeah. or you know head of growth as you yeah. mentioned right so you, yeah, you start yeah, with exactly. people who are really good at content writing or like researching or like but you know being content folks and then from there on mm -hmm. you expand on them 100 percent, yeah yeah mm -hmm. uh, and you have to invest time you know obviously our head of growth she was an English teacher before she was a writer with us. She has no background in SEO or marketing or anything like yeah. that. So we did invest a lot of time in her education and development, but it was so worth it because, you know, she already has the skills. She knows how to learn. And I think a lot of writers know how to learn things very well because they know how to do research. If they're good writers, they do research every yeah. day, all day. So absorbing new information is, I think, much easier for a writer then um, maybe someone who's, I mean, I don't want to bash anyone. There are smart people everywhere, of course. Yeah. But, uh, you know, if you don't know what you're doing, you just want someone who's, I don't know, good at learning, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and the easiest way to identify that, I think, is through writers because uh, it's just very evident if they are good researchers or not. Whereas yeah, yeah, yeah. If you hire a content manager, it's harder to tell, like, oh, did I make the right choice? You know, is this person good? Are they going to adapt to my process or not? So, yeah, I remember seeing a post from uh, Nick Jordan a couple of days back uh, about how he, mm -hmm. like, he mentioned it, your director of SEO uh, needs to yeah. be really equipped with content, right? Uh, and that should yeah. be one of his or her core strengths. Uh, and I totally agree with that. I think. Um, content itself because you know in general when we think of seo especially for SaaS businesses content is the biggest element to work on right yeah uh, like of course links help technical seo can also be helpful in some scenarios but content will always be the biggest aspect to focus on uh so by default you need someone who is pretty well equipped in that right 100 percent. yeah our uh director of content who's actually now our coo so i should stop calling him that uh he was a writer you know a few eight years ago or something i actually have no idea how long ago but he was a writer then he was an editor then he was a content manager then he started learning more like a technical side of seo and you know now he's running a huge operation and yeah yeah i think the reason why he can do it and have empathy for the team is because he went through all of that and there is a lot of value in it. yeah totally um i also remember by the way you know my white man point i was like you know uh, i remember just being the only strategist for flying cat uh, handling a bunch of clients and my wife told me that i should be writing one article a month for at least our own website because it just helps me work better with other writers and know what exactly they go through etc and uh, i definitely learned a lot from that experience um yeah 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 yeah, yeah. uh she was 100 percent right <laughs> with that yeah. like, uh, <laughs> totally. it's so important like boy our, our ceo former director of seo he he doesn't write content for clients anymore but he writes these case studies now and it's taking him a million years obviously because he kind of lost you know this park i guess uh <laughs> he lost a lot of words i think uh you know his vocabulary is not that rich anymore but he's still writing you know once every month every yeah. two months he, he just writes a piece of content and yeah, it just reminds you, like, hey, my team is actually doing a really good job, and I should be easier on them because this is hard. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and what would you say is the ideal tech stack? So again, you know, being in the same shoes of you know you being that advisor to a yeah. SaaS company, 
if they were to ask you, hey, what do we need from a tech stack standpoint to build this content ops engine? What would you advise? <laughs> that is such a great question. I actually uh, read uh, this very similar question yesterday in uh, Women in Tech, no, Sisters in SEO uh, Facebook group. It's a great group for okay. all the ladies. Um, so, all right, I, I actually have the perfect text. <laughs> I think I figured it out. So let's start with awesome. uh, with like the first step, hiring. Obviously, I'm gonna say work hello because it's yeah. it's just good. Uh, just do it. Just try it. Test your writers before you hire them. Test your editors before you hire them. It's just so easy. Uh, so definitely one click thing, and you're done. Um, so start with that. Other. Same. Yeah, shout out to work a lot. <laughs> uh, then if we if we move on to um, SEO, I guess grounds obviously Ahrefs. Everyone uses that for keyword research. We use Cluster AI to group our keywords. Um, honestly, I can't remember the last time anyone grouped anything manually. So why would you do it? It's a uh, it's one of those things where you can save money by saving time and <laughs> just get a tool uh, and let yeah. a tool do it. Um, we obviously we use Screaming Frog for you know SEO technical things. I'm not very technical as you can see. Uh, then on the content side, we use Airtable to manage our content calendar. Highly recommend. Uh, we use Slight, uh, which is a Notion competitor, to manage our knowledge base because <laughs> we have a lot of knowledge base articles. Um, we use. Uh, and then, by the way, Beverly, when you say Sorry, sorry to mm -hmm. cut you off. When you say knowledge yeah. base, you mean all of the SOPs, everything, um, everything yes. included, yes. right? Right. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's like Notion. I mean, I know a lot of people tried Notion, but this is a little bit faster, in my opinion, and better for remote teams. So I, I really like it. Um, yeah. Then we use Grammarly. Obviously, can't go without it. Uh, you know, Hemingway sometimes for readability, but it's not like a must have for us. Uh, obviously Slack and Zoom for communication. And then you have some analytics tools that I don't even know if I should go into them because of GA drama. I'm not even, uh, I don't I don't go there anymore because I don't know how to uh -huh. use it. Um, <laughs> and yeah, we, we, we have some video editing um, tools that our video editor uses. I think he's on Adobe Premiere. Um, and we use Crisp for um, support, mm -hmm. but I guess I guess you don't need that for content. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and yeah, I think that's it. Maybe I forgot something, yeah. but I think that's it's it. It's a pretty well-packed uh, tech stack for sure. Yeah, it covers it's almost great. everything. Yeah, like you have to understand, not you, sorry for saying it like this, but you know, as a company, if you want to publish content, you have to be willing to invest in that content and not just in the writers, but you also need to invest in your tech stack because don't manage, you know, your content calendar in Google Sheets because that's just a nightmare. Don't do it. You're going to get stuck there. Just don't. Choose Airtable. Do it in Airtable. Yeah. You know, don't hire writers through email because you're going to be overwhelmed in two seconds and you're never going to go through those emails use work hello you know to just get out of your inbox and, and kind of manage it somewhere else um and same for everything else you know don't use email for day-to-day -day communication use slack because it's easier um and i know those costs can add up you know we spend probably two to three thousand dollars a month on just tech stack on just tools that we use but yeah. again it saves money it saves time it saves you know my hour is expensive but my ceo's hour is even more expensive so is it really worth it that we spend so much time kind of fumbling with apps where we can just have an app to do it for us uh so yeah invest right. uh, spend money to make money yeah totally um and if i were to you know going back to the approach that you folks have to publishing content in this content strategy typically um if I were to summarize, and you let me know if I'm getting this right, if I miss anything, right? So yeah. if I were to summarize, it is you just figure out what you have to create, like as in the content that resonates with your audience and like you have done your research, etc. You lay it out in a long content plan for the next, you know, eight to 12 months, whatever is the time period. And then you like, you, you basically lay out all of the content that you have to produce. And then you just publish really, really fast as soon as possible, right? Um, yes. Is that correct? Yeah. Right. That is exactly it. Yeah. Yeah. 
So, you know, I'm definitely sure you've uh, heard this opinion or argument, um, you know, previously as well, but some people have just this quality versus quantity argument to present, right? Yeah. Like when you just produce so much, it's very hard to maintain quality. Uh, and, you know, Google cares about quality, not quantity, those kind of things, you know, but you actually have those, those results that speak for themselves. Uh, what yeah. is your opinion about this? How do you, you know, mm -hmm. um, react to this uh, quality versus quantity argument? Yeah. So for me, it's not even a debate, honestly. Like, I understand why people do it, but the debate doesn't exist for me because there is no quantity without quality in our book. Um, you know, I'll tell you a story, actually. Uh, so we had this client. We were publishing six to 800 pages a month uh, for them. That is crazy, you know. That is just way too many pages. That is crazy. We still managed. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> But, you know, we had such a big team and we had so many of these processes already laid out that it was possible to create high quality pages, even at that scale. Uh, but they wanted to scale it to 2000 pages a month and we just couldn't do it. Uh, I think at that point, you know, for us at that point, it was impossible to maintain the quality and spit out, you know, 2000 pages a month. So we just didn't do it uh, because I don't want to put out something this bad. And... Yeah. yeah, uh you know the argument Google likes quality uh, not quantity. I mean it's it's not true I think. Of course you need to have quality content, but also, you know, John Mueller and and all of these very important people said I can't think of a 30-page website as authoritative. And it just makes a lot of sense because now I literally this weekend can go and generate uh 30 articles with AI or or just hire a writer to write me 30 articles for $5 an article. It's going to be so bad. It's going to be borderline unreadable, but I can do it and I can have 30 pages. And uh, am I going to be an authority? No. Even if I have 30 amazing pages and I spent a lot of time publishing them, I'm not an authority on the topic because I just didn't invest my time, my money, my energy into proving to Google and everyone else that I know what I'm talking about. Um, so for me, it's not a debate. There is no quantity without quality. And um, we just, I don't know, I, I would never put out something that's bad, <laughs> you know, no matter yeah. the scale. Uh, there is a cap, you know, at, you know, we can go this high and we can't go higher because we are going to be compromising quality after that. And everyone's yeah. cap is a little bit different. Uh, so no matter what yours is, just do as much as you can while maintaining quality. For some people, that's 20 articles a month. For some people, that's mm. 100 a month. So it really depends on how big your team is, how good your system is, how big your budget is, of course. Um, yeah. But figure all of that out and just figure out what's the highest you can go. The higher, the better. Yeah. The quality has to be there. I, I agree. I think, uh, uh, again, as you said, you know, there's no uh, quality without quantity. Uh, as, a, as a whole, like if you're defining quality as in how qualitative this one page is, then of course one can say if I've spent 30 days on creating one page, it would be you know of good quality. But then you yeah. also have to think of the quality of the website as a whole, right? As you mentioned, exactly. This, yeah. uh, tweet from John Mueller: If you have 30 pages, it's very hard to think of your website as something authoritative. Um, and then even if you get into the systems of Google, how they build topical authority and those kind of things, of course it makes sense. Like you just need really a lot of content to you know, be yeah. seen as trustworthy. Yeah, and I know a lot of people don't like to hear that. And I understand, you know, it's it's mostly, I hear a lot of this on LinkedIn and mostly from really, really good content writers. And I understand, like, I mean, I used to do that. And and yeah. I was like, oh my God, like, sorry about this. Uh, Greeks love no motorcycles. Uh, <laughs> I understand, you know, as as a writer, I would much rather spend 10 days writing one piece of content and just making sure it's absolutely perfect before I publish it because I want to be proud of what I'm putting out. Like, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, but you have to think of the business. It's not just you being an artist and, and creating this art piece. Content is not art. It's, it's, it's business, you know? It's not like yeah. a beautiful painting or a book that you're writing and, and you're a perfectionist and you want everything to be perfect. Um, it should mm -hmm. be good. It should be very good. It should be more valuable than anything else Google can show. But you need to check your ego at the door and just understand that you can't create perfection. 
And it's just something that you can always go back to and update that piece of content, which you have to do either way because things change and, you know, the world is crazy right now. Yeah. So I get it, but uh, like guys, that's not how you build websites. That's you're not gonna go anywhere with it. You just need more, unfortunately, or yeah. fortunately for me and uh, everyone else who's running an agency, <laughs> right? <laughs> so it yeah, makes sense. Done is better than perfect, I think. Um, yeah. So have you have you ever seen this backfiring? This approach of you know publishing a lot of content. Um, in any of your client or maybe some other um, company that you've noticed in the space, have you ever seen you know publishing a lot of content backfiring as in like you know actually deteriorating your performance? So for no, honestly no, <laughs> I have not seen this backfiring ever. Uh, the only way I can see it backfire, I guess, is if you create a lot of irrelevant content. I don't know if you're like a dog website and you start writing about fish all of a sudden, like that really doesn't make sense. I don't yeah. know who would do that, but I guess like, I don't know, you can. Right, uh, right. You can hire a wrong person to, to you know, or a wrong agency that just chooses something that's not really for you. Um, I personally have never seen it. From my experience, the more we publish, the better results we get. And it's just a matter of, honestly like your budget and how how much you're willing to spend on this uh but the return is much much greater than the investments always so mm. um again i haven't seen it but i imagine that it can happen if if you publish something that has nothing to do with with what your business is doing um yeah. or i don't know i guess if you like use a lot of AI to generate a lot of irrelevant and like thin content, then maybe it could backfire. But again, I have not seen this happen. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, I have two, you know, more things to you know discuss in, in regards to publishing a lot of content. So yeah, there are these two to three different concerns. For example, one is: is there a way we can still manage to keep the cost low while we try to scale up our content production? Uh, and then yeah. there are other concerns of, you know, is there a way we can source, you know, actual subject matter expertise from other folks mm -hmm. uh, on such yeah. a bigger scale? So, like, for these two concerns, how would you address them? Have you cracked this? Yes, actually, yes, especially for the first one. Um, so this is actually kind of the the biggest question that we get uh, when we run work out like, oh, I can't pay, you know, 500 or a thousand dollars per article. Like I can, but I can only publish six per month instead of 20. So um, as a proud non-American, <laughs> my best advice is don't hire Americans, uh, just hire writers who are not living in one of the most expensive countries in the world and that is the best way to cut content costs and i know a lot of people are it's kind of a touchy subject to be honest because it can get very ugly very fast but in my opinion it's better to pay someone fairly in a country that's you know lower cost of living than the U.S. is, than yeah. to underpay someone in the U.S. So that was our tactic too. Um, you know, obviously I'm you know I'm Serbian. I'm from Serbia. So when we started building our team, I was like, let's just build it here, uh, because I know that people are highly educated. I know they that people generally yeah. speak good English, and why not? Let's just try it. Uh, and of course, the costs are way way lower than if we were to hire American writers. Right. Um, and by the way, does that also mean that you're not particularly inclined to um, only work with native writers? I'm not. I, I have worked with native writers before. Yeah. Um, and but it's not I don't know. Honestly, right? No, no, no. Not at all. Not at all. Okay. Uh, I think uh, all of my writers right now are non-natives. I'm not sure. I'm going to have to check. But, you know, I've, I've worked with native writers before and I don't know. It's kind of the same to me. I don't really see a lot of a difference because we generally, okay. when we when we hire non-native writers, we tend to hire people, um, you know, who've studied English or they have mm. these crazy like master's degrees and they're really smart and you know they're very very fluent. So you can't really tell. Um, so yeah, start there. Hire someone in I don't know the Eastern Europe is great. Mm. Uh, Colombia is great. I know a lot of people hire writers from the Philippines. I think the Philippines are better for VAs 
uh, not so much writers, but I know that people have hired writers there as well. But Eastern Europe is my favorite. So uh, yeah, that's how you can lower your content costs. Uh, just uh, right. give someone a chance that you may not necessarily think is yeah. it's going to be uh, like, oh, they're not a native speaker, so they don't know what yeah. they're talking about. Well, they actually do, so hire them. Yeah. Um, and and sorry, what was the second one? <laughs> It is subject matter expertise. So oh, yeah. is there a system to like, you know, source those kind of insights, especially on such a bigger scale? Yeah. So I think as an agency, uh, when you work with your clients, your client is probably going to be an expert because they started yeah. the business. They know exactly what they're talking about and they are an expert. So um, we use our clients as subject matter experts. And the way we do it is through knowledge transfer. So every now and then, especially when we start a project, we have these knowledge transfer sessions with our clients where we sit just like you and I are sitting right now and we just ask them a million questions, we record it, and then we turn that podcast or that knowledge uh, transfer session into SOPs. So enablement oh, documentation nice. that our team can use when they are producing content and of course, you know, we use that enablement documentation when we make the content series template. So we extract uh, relevant information from the big, big, big document to a specific content series so our writers can use that specific information. So uh, for any agency, I think that's the best way to go. Anyone else, um, I don't know, if you're building like a niche website, do you really want to build something that requires uh, you to find an expert for you know, something that you don't know what you're talking about. Is that really the best website to build? Or would it be better to build something that you kind of know what you're talking about and it's much easier to find either yourself or someone from that niche because you're already in it uh, to just kind of give you a quote or an opinion or right. review something. Um, but of course, there are tactics that people use out there. Um, there's this, uh, what's it called? Uh, they changed their name recently. It's featured. It used to be Turkle. I think that's a good way to find quotes from experts on anything. Mm -hmm. Just yeah. post your question there and get some quotes. Um, or, you know, you leverage your, your network. Uh, it's probably the best way. But for us, we use our clients. Yeah, yeah that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, we have a similar kind of an approach. So, yeah, I agree. Like most in most of the cases, your own client is the subject matter expert, and they typically have a lot of opinions about everything. So you're yeah. not actually just getting, you know, the the expertise in that subject, but also the narrative of the company. Like, you know, what do they think about that particular subject? Uh, so like, yeah, yeah, like exactly. turning that into documentation. Yeah, yeah. You just uh, exactly what you said. You document their strong opinions, and you use that when you when you write content. So. Yeah, uh, it hasn't failed yet, uh, so I think it's a good system. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course, well. totally. Yeah. Um, so when when you think of working with writers, uh, do you also think people who are specialized in specific industries or verticals are better than you know those all rounder kind of con people, or would you say there there's not much of a difference? It depends on the type of project. If it's something highly highly technical. Like uh, I had a customer not too long ago. They, oh my God, they had something so complicated. I don't even know what it is. It's some kind of QA <laughs> system. It's developer it, stuff, it, it, right? Indeed, it was complicated if you don't even remember, right? So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So for, for those things, I mean, it's way easier to just find someone who already knows what they're talking about if it's right. something highly technical uh, for, and, you know, highly medical. Uh, mm -hmm. I wouldn't trust just anyone to write a medical article or yeah. anything else. I think you can teach your writers, honestly, anything with good enablement documentation. So we, for example, worked on <laughs> so many different projects all at once. Like there was a pet project and then there was this like email marketing tool. And uh, I don't know, a couple others. Our writers are generalists, but because mm -hmm. they have really good documentation and really good enablement documentation first of all uh they're just able to learn whatever they need to learn but if you do need to hire niche writers which some people do um here's what i recommend go to interest-based communities so there are a lot of communities on reddit on facebook on any social media for any job 
that you can think of in this world, like nurses, paralegals, you know, mechanics, anything. Uh, find those communities and try to find someone who wants to write for you in that community. And for example, if you need medical content, if you need uh, legal content, you're not going to hire lawyers because they are yeah. expensive, right? Hire par paralegals. They have all the knowledge, but uh, you're basically competing with their day job, right? Um, right. So I, I, as a lawyer, can make a lot more in my regular job than I can make writing for you. Why would I write for you? There's no, there's no reason why. But if I'm a paralegal um, or, I don't know, I'm a nurse or like a mm. nurse's assistant, I make yeah. way less money than a doctor. I may be willing to, you know, have like a side hustle and just write some articles like that. Yeah, very smart. Um, yeah. So anyone who needs niche writers, uh, highly recommend. I can actually send you. I have a list of about three hundred resources uh, for where you can find niche writers. Maybe you can include it awesome. somewhere. Sure uh, thing. So uh, yeah, that'd be amazing. Good yeah. 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 Good. Yeah, mm -hmm. Awesome. Sounds good. So. Uh, and then, you know, lastly, I would like to talk about, you know, the elephant in the room. What do you think of, you know, AI when it comes to content creation or in general, how are you utilizing AI so far in your agency or for Workello in any way, any mm -hmm. shape or form, let it be in the systems, like in the content ops engine, or maybe mm -hmm. in actual content production. So is there any mm -hmm. use case that you've seen so far? Yeah, so we don't use it for content creation because I personally don't think it's there yet. It's obviously way better than it was a few years ago, but you can tell when something was written by AI. I, I think you can tell. Uh, I don't know, it's very surface level, very simplistic. And for the type of content that we work on for our clients, we just can't use AI uh, because of all of this uh, you know, knowledge transfer that we do and all these strong opinions. Uh, AI yeah. doesn't have those opinions mm -hmm. and we would have to feed it thousands and thousands of pages for it to like, first of all, understand what we need it to do. So we don't use it for content creation, but I actually do use AI for other stuff. And I love it, <laughs> like, honestly, I love it. Um, we, um, you know, have these SOPs and everything. So I use the scripts, uh, you know, just record myself talking. I use the scripts to transcribe it and then put it in chat GPT. And because awesome. as you can tell, I like to use a lot of ums and uh, you knows. <laughs> Not very good at that. So I just tell it like, hey, delete all the filler words, please. And just format this into an SOP. It's great. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I love it. Uh, it cuts down on, on a lot of the time. Uh, and then just some random stuff like testing it out for bits and pieces here and there, but not in content creation because I honestly, I wouldn't dare, you know, <laughs> use it mm. for content yet. Yeah. Uh, I like, I know what my writers can do. I know what yeah. kind of documentation I give them and I control everything, every single variable there. But I don't know what AI is going to spit out. It's like, is it going to be yeah. correct? Is it going to make up something? So, yeah. But yeah, I well, love I it. agree. I think, yeah, totally. I think there are far more use cases of AI that, you know, people can think of and use effectively than content yeah. creation at this point, right? Uh, like yeah. one, one thing that I've been experimenting a lot with is just creating a lot of Google sheet scripts, like, you know, just to automate a lot of things. Um, so yeah, but content smart. creation itself is, I, I agree, it's not there yet. And again, you, you don't exactly know whether all of the people that are, you know, publishing so much content at this point using AI, uh, what the results will look like in five to six months from now. So like, it's kind of a bet at this point. You might want to wait yeah. a while to see, you know, how they play out in the long run. And then you might want to jump on that ride. Um, yeah. That's exactly it. Like we've seen a couple of examples in our group of people who are like, oh, I just published 100 pages with AI. And then literally two months later, they come and like, I've been hit. All my traffic is down. Why? Yeah. Like, I don't know why. Like you use it. <laughs> I have no idea why. <laughs> you know, you mm -hmm. don't even know why. So it is risky. I wouldn't like dare use it on a client project. Um, we, I think we need to wait a couple of years uh, for it to yeah. get a little bit better before we can use it for content creation. But like you said, there are many use cases and why not? If it can make your life easier and faster, I'm always for working smarter and not harder. <laughs> 
because there's yeah. a lot of stuff to do, right? Totally. Uh, so last thing, um, imagine you're you know sitting with a, a B2B SaaS content marketing specialist. It's their, you know, like that, they're the only solo marketer in that company and you're sitting with them in this bar, right? Like in this cafe already, you know, just enjoying your drink, having a nice evening. Uh, and you are to advise them how they can provide the best, uh, like how they can shorten the time to value for their leaders, uh, being the mm -hmm. only person at this company, not having a big budget, right? Uh, being mm -hmm. in that scenario where they have limited resources, but still ambitions really big. Uh, how would you say their DAC, the content marketing thing for their company? Yeah. Ooh, okay, that's good. <laughs> Uh, so I guess the first thing that they can do is just start writing a couple pieces themselves to, again, document those thoughts that mm. the company has about the product and about the market and everything. Um, actually, I forgot to mention this before, um, you know, when we were talking about hiring writers, like, just hire a writer first. Yes, hire a writer first. but write a couple pieces yourself first, you know, see mm. what it's like, document your thoughts, much, much easier. Um, nice. From there, after they've done that, I would start just documenting that process, uh, creating this enablement documentation. They can either interview themselves or interview their, you know, CEO or, or someone higher up at the company, like a stakeholder uh, to get that knowledge transfer so they can start making documentation. And then if the budget is really limited, hire one writer. You don't have to hire five. Hire one and just work with them. Uh, go slow. And I mean, the, <laughs> the sad thing or a good thing, depends on who you are, about content marketing and SEO is that it is an investment. And uh, not everyone is going to be ready to invest a lot of money into it from the get-go. But yeah. then it's like a vicious cycle. If you don't invest the money, you're not going to publish enough pages and your graph is not going to be as big, so you're not going to invest the money. Um, so, but something is better than nothing, right? So just start publishing as much as you can with the budget that you have. And I promise you that you will see results. They're not going to be crazy results if you only publish, you know, two or four pages a month. Uh, yeah. But you will see that graph going up if you create the highest quality page Google can show for the given keyword. You will mm. see something happening. And then hopefully when the stakeholders see like, hey, this is actually working, let's pump some more money into this, um, you know, the more the better. And yeah. it has never not worked if you do it correctly. <laughs> so there's no way for this to fail. You just got to do it right. And yeah. doing it right is not even that hard. Um, mm. I think a lot of SEOs complicate things too much and you know, like 500 ranking factors and you got to do yeah. this <laughs> thing and that. No, just make good content. Make it, think of your reader, have empathy for your reader. What do they need to know and what do they need to know next? And just give it to them. And if you treat Google's users, uh, sorry, <laughs> if you treat Google's users right, Google will treat you right back uh, mm -hmm. because it can see you as a good source uh, to send their users to. You know, you're not like a scammer. You're not publishing stupid things, right? You are a good yeah. resource. Why wouldn't it reward you with traffic and conversions mm -hmm. and everything else? Um, so yeah. yeah, whoever you are, just start. Don't wait. Uh, you know, the best. Best time to start was yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Time. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, I imagine, you know, like just a few days back, in fact, we were having a discussion with our client of ours and we, they had the same problem. They were thinking of, you know, like they wanted to start, uh, but then they had ambitious targets. They wanted to, you know, drive a lot of traffic, et cetera, but they were like not liking the slow progress as a start. Uh, so like mm -hmm. you have to start somewhere and it will be slow over the first few months, but then if you just do things right, it's going to skyrocket really soon. Um, yeah. So yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And if you, uh, if there's this thing that, uh, you know, my, my CEO and my CEO, oh, they like to say when you, if you're hiring a content agency or if you're hiring yourself to be your own content agency, mm -hmm. uh, here's how you can figure it out. If your campaign is, is going right. Every 10 weeks, whatever, like the last 10 weeks that you take, 
if your traffic has gone up eight out of the 10 weeks, you're doing something right. Uh, you know, maybe two weeks are a little bit down, but yeah. eight weeks are good, things are going well. And that's kind of how you can evaluate your SEO vendors and agencies, but also yourself to see if you are doing the right thing. If you're not, uh, there is help out there. You know, if you want to do it on your own, as I said, you know, we have our SOPs, you guys have your own. A lot yeah. of people have them. There are tools out there that can help you uh, just start to do it. <laughs> I love and, that approach, by the way, yeah. that uh, the weeks approach that you just mentioned, I think that definitely is good. That it basically eradicates, yeah. you know, the seasonality effect and all of those kind of things. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And you can evaluate if, if you know, things are going in the right direction, so yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much, Gordon. I totally love this. Thank you. Um, oh, I, me I too. I had so much one, fun. Yeah, I, I think this is one of the episodes that I've enjoyed the most. Um, you know, oh, just like, thank you. Yeah, I, and I really have learned a lot throughout the whole interview myself. So I appreciate the time. Yeah, thank you so much. I was so excited for this. Like, I know you had Amelia on, and I was like, oh my God, I love Amelia. She's my favorite. Yeah. Uh, and so I just, uh, I couldn't wait to 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 talk to you as well. So yeah. thank you so much for inviting me. I'm very honored. Where, where would you say people can find you if they were to connect with you or follow your content and those kind of things? Yeah, for sure. So uh, we publish a lot of stuff, right? A lot of our, our um, case studies on contentdistribution.com. You can check out HR and kind of hiring related content on workello.com. Also, you can hire writers there. Uh, and then you can follow me on LinkedIn. Um, I can drop my, my account somewhere, but it's my name, Gordon Sretenich, 923. Uh, I'll and drop it. Yeah, 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 I have a weird name. I'm sorry. No one can spell it. <laughs> uh, and we have a Facebook group called Fatcraft Content Ops yeah. with about 10,000 marketers. It's a pretty cool, cool group. Uh, lots of great AMAs there. So join us and uh, let's have some fun together. Yeah, I, I, I can personally vouch for the AMA in the Facebook group. It's amazing oh, every, every time. And the, and the choice of guests that you folks have, it's incredible. Oh, thank you. Uh, well, you'll be happy for an AMA today. Because we have a very, <laughs> very special guest. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you again. And uh, yeah, let's let's catch up again. Sure.